Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. This is a smart music session on all music for all. My name is Ted Scalzo. I'm an education specialist here at Make Music. I'm also a high, uh, high school band director who's recently retired after 36 years in the classroom and also 10 years as an adjunct professor at Hofstra University. Um, currently, I'm living in uh, the San Antonio area and um, due to COVID, not doing much playing, but um, happy to be here with you today anyway. Uh, one of the things we're looking to discuss today is using all of the tools, all of the music and smart music in different ways. The first couple of things we need to clarify is smart music's really got three things going for it. It got a bunch of practice tools, having a tuner, a metronome, a ton of essential content exercises, sight reading, scales, and additional content that you can add to fit your needs. And that's really what our focus is going to be today. And smart music provides feedback to your students as they're practicing their assigned pieces, letting them know about red note, green note, whether the pitch is right or wrong, yellow if the rhythm is incorrect. And then um, by creating assignments for your students, guiding them in their practice, steering the way they use smart music, you're going to be able to create a very rich, um, resourceful practice material for your students that guides them to becoming better musicians. The feedback loop on this is obviously that red note, green note, but it's also giving comments back to the student when they do some kind of a performance assessment for you. And also making the students give you feedback in their comments box, part of the cycle. So you all should be aware that this is what a, a smart music screen looks like. It's giving us um, the feedback from a student assignment. We see the red note, green note on here. Uh, we see a recording grade and assessment grade. That's the smart music red note, green note. The recording grade was a rubric designed by the teacher. And what's missing in this particular one are those comments. And that's what we would wanna uh, make sure that we continue in the loop. But today's focus is really here um, this is a really rich, valuable resource of online music material that you can use with your students. And what I think happens to us as teachers is we think, okay, here are the performance pieces. Here's the method book I use. And we, we look at the material that only seems very obvious to us as to what we're going to do. And what I'm going to suggest to you today is that we look at all of the material that's here in Smart Music and start thinking of some uh, ways that we can expose our students to more of the good resources that are here. Um, you have the ability here uh, to do all kinds of solo work, technical work, um, have your instrumentalist sing, have your vocalist sing instrumental uh, music, look at um, uh, Suzuki materials, look at the small ensemble materials, and, and that's really what we're going to talk about. So the basic premise of the presentation, all of this music for everyone. So starting off with just method books alone, um, it's very easy for us to, you know, pick our favorite method book, hang in there with that and, you know, um, do our teaching for a year and um, stay focused on that. But with 185 different method books in there, you've got more resources that could provide even more um, positive reinforcement for your students. So you can assign them one piece in, in one of these method books. And then in the comments box, say, you know, in addition to this, I want you to explore these two, three, four different methods and look for the same piece. And then in the comments box, when you hand in your assignment from this method book, I want you to share with me what you discovered. Because now what we've got them doing is we've got them exploring um, that same tune. They're still working on the um, materials, the skills that you want them to practice, but they're doing it cross platform. They're looking at, you know, that same tune, maybe with a different accompaniment, um, maybe a slightly different tempo, um, but it's getting them to still work on what you asked them to do but looking at it in some different ways. Sometimes it's, it's you know, we have a, a song, let's say we're learning, 
And it would be so easy for us to just go to the next line, but maybe you'd like to linger there a little bit longer because you know that if we just spent another week on this, we're really going to um, be set for moving ahead the following week. So by changing up the material, moving laterally, um, we're providing, a, a you know, again, a, a sliding resource that keeps it fresh for the student and at the same time reinforces the skills we know they need to develop. Um, I know teachers who have created fun scavenger hunts where they give a title and they say, okay, I want you to search these method books, find it, and then, you know, give me some feedback on it. Um, other teachers I know, like, you know, there's a, a basic tune that we all tend to, uh, you know, strive for in learning an instrument is hot cross buns. It's three, some, three uh, pitches, and it allows us um, the ability to, you know, start teaching song and um, form and, um, you know, connecting the notes, all those good things. And then if you can find hot cross buns, let's say in some different uh, method books, what a great way for that, you know, to uh, transfer the learning you've already been working on. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to step out of um, smart music. I mean, out of our uh, presentation here. And let's look at smart music. So Right now, what I'm on is a, a homepage. I already put in a search. You'll see over here, it says method books. Um, it might be high, uh, small, but there it is. And as you can see over here, there's 182 titles available. Okay. Um, I'm working in sound innovations. So I'm going to do a quick search for sound innovations. That brings up all the Sound Innovations titles. I'm gonna look specifically at the concert band when I'm opening that one up. And what I'd like to do is assign hot cross buns to my student. So now I'm gonna click on assign. <clears throat> It'll bring me through all the dialogue boxes that are necessary for doing that. Let me just enlarge the screen a little bit. And of course, you know, these, this is, you all know this, you select what kind of an assignment type for method books, it's always custom. And then we have some more parameters here. Uh, my recommendation for assignments, especially beginners um, and vocalists, is easy at first. And once they're doing really well there, then we'll increase those tolerance levels. But what I would say here is I'm not going to take the time to type it, but the instructions would be, okay, you're going to hand in hot cross buns next Thursday. But before then, I want you to practice the lines that are leading up to hot cross buns. And this is a tip right now on how to not load up your grade book. Also, how to not like just load a whole bunch of exercises that may make your students feel overwhelmed um, when they see a bunch of assignments do in a, in our box. It, it's a little you know daunting, but if you have one assignment and inside the one assignment you're telling them yeah, but you got to do one through seventeen, it's a little less um, of a scare. So what I'm going to say on this one is I would say to them, okay, you're going to hand in hot cross buns. That's your, you know, main performance grade, but to get really good at performing hot cross buns, I need you to look at the lines one through 17 that we've been practicing. And I want you to, over this next week, practice those lines. Um, and I'll be able to see in analytics, whether or not you've done that. So 50% of your grade is going to be the performance of hot cross buns. And then the other 50% is going to be, did you work on those additional lines that give you the skills you need to be able to perform hot cross buns well? So that, that's uh, one type of assignment. Again, I'll have to go back and look at analytics for my students and just check to see if they've done um, what I've required them to do. And then the other is you could say to your students, okay, you're handing in hot cross buns next Thursday. Um, however, in um, accent on achievement and um, essential elements and whatever method book, there's also hot cross buns. I want you to go in there and I want you to practice those. And then the night before your assignments do in the comments box, just tell me what you found um, the experience to be practicing hot cross buns in those different um, method books. So we're getting our students to, yes, use a method book we prefer. We're getting them to explore the other method books. They're getting even more comfortable with smart music in terms of getting around. And now that smart music's material is available to everyone, this is definitely what you want your students to be doing, um, encouraging that exploration. Because if your assignment gets them on this path, eventually they're going to start doing these kinds of things on their own. 
And that's definitely something um, you're all going to want uh, to encourage because the more exploration they're doing, the more playing they're doing. Obviously, you want them to do your assignments because you want to get them uh, to a certain performance level. And you know, as the teacher, what they need. But getting them uh, excited about looking at other material is, is as valuable as our instruction. Um, so those are a couple of examples of how you, you would uh, possibly use a method book. And again, uh, we could look at, uh, you know, 182 different method books in here. But the idea is um, to get your students um, in an assignment that gets them exploring that way. So Suzuki. Um, it's a wonderful method. Um, we're all aware of it. We all understand its premises that we use, um, that skill of learning language for our students to learn music at first. So there is a focus on the ear, even though there's written notes here, um, there, um, as a beginning Suzuki student, you're expected to learn a lot of your music by rote, which is not, um, necessarily a bad thing. Um, getting our students to first focus on sound is really important for us. And you're looking at this and you may be thinking, well, this is great for all our violin um, students, but I'm going to strongly recommend that um, all the instrumental teachers and vocal teachers take a real hard look at the Suzuki method. Um, and specifically those first three volumes that have just been redone, um, it's volumes one through three, international edition, and it's featuring uh, a world-renowned artist. And what she has done to the recordings is taken them as, from being really great resources for teaching to being exquisite performance material that all students should be exposed to. There is so much to be learned just from a listening standpoint. So take a look at those. Um, look at those um, beginning um, folk tunes that are in there. Um, let's actually take a look at a couple of uh, the materials that are uh, in the Suzuki Violin Book 1. So let's just take a second and, and just listen to how this artist performs this great folk song. <laughs> So your assignment could simply be um, send this to your students and explain to them that they're um, going to just listen to it and give you uh, a comment back in the comments box um, and grade them on, you know, did, you know, they give you enough uh, information from listening to it. Uh, the other thing you could do is instrumental teachers is say to your students, I just want you to sing that on law. And don't worry about it if you think, you know, you're wrong pitch. But I just want you to try singing and make your sound match Hilary Hans. And then maybe after that assignment, what you could do is you could say, you know, I want you to practice that first phrase. So, yeah, there are a couple of obstacles here. Maybe this key is not the key um, your trombone player is playing in. But what you could do is tell the student to find the first note. OK, and you can click on it. Um, it'll play the first note, um, find that on your instrument, and then have them learn and figure it out. Now, obviously, I wouldn't assign the entire piece if that were the kind of assignment I do. I'd go in small chunks. Here's where I would probably, you know, set up a loop um, and tell the student, okay, I just want you to learn maybe the first two bars. And then after you've learned the first two bars, let's go ahead and chunk it and learn the next four. And then Let's talk about making this whole um, eight measures, one long, beautiful phrase. So you see where I'm going here. There's a, 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 a series of assignments that could come out of this one beautiful piece. And again, we're getting our students to listen. They're being exposed to a really great performance in time, in tune, musically presented. Um, that is now going to be a model that's in their ear. And the sooner we do this, the better our students are gonna be. Um, I would strongly encourage if you're a general music teacher, here's a great resource. Have the students clap along, have the students sing along. Um, one of the things I always have great success with is having students hum and then putting a finger in the air so they really get to feel the resonance of the hum along with the performance piece. 
So take a look at this um, wonderful resource and don't just stop at the violin books. Take the time to look at all the other books. There's a great resource of material here that's valuable for all students. And by the way, if it's a transposing instrument, again, have them find the first sound, build it in chunks, have them work on it by ear. Um, great, great resource, great tool. So traditionally, again, we, we, we kind of look at our uh, method books. We may even look at our method books for some of the ensemble things we do. And then we look at the large performance group literature, um, you know, for our band, orchestras, choirs, and jazz bands. Um, but smart music also has um, a very rich resource now of small ensemble titles. And it's, it looks at first, when you look at the number, you go, oh, there's only 88 there. But when you really look hard at the 88, those 88 are really thousands um, because um, it's you know, you know a series of, let's say, the adaptable quartets, but they're available for a whole bunch of different instruments, okay? Um, same thing with the trios. There's some vocal, small vocal ensemble pieces in there. Um, there's uh, a couple of duets in there called The Power of Two, which are fantastic for exposing your students to a jazz style um, and at the same time getting them to um, dive into the literature. And it's only two lines and it's at, a, I would say, an uh, advanced, easy, intermediate level. Um, so it's accessible. Um, it's also fun, you know, if, if you've you know, been doing, you say, your method books and your concert prep and now you're looking for something um, a little bit different, but it's still going to provide great music education for your students, exposure to new style. Um, it's, it's a great resource. And then the, the first series of material that's in the small ensembles is the entire Canadian Brass Library. So what um, I've been finding all across the country is uh, many of our um, teachers are using um, these small ensemble pieces for um, their groups. One of the things um, I, I've become aware of is string teachers are finding that by assigning the Canadian brass material, um, it, there's a clarity here that really helps their students find their part and play along. And at the same time, it's prepping them for that transition to full orchestra, where now it's going to be all of the wind percussion and strings. So. Um, something for you to uh, definitely look at. Um, so let me um, go back to smart music and let's, let's look at some of the small ensemble titles. So this is in particular is for a uh, choral. All right. This is a uh, choral uh, piece based on an opera and they're all the parts. Okay. Switch it over to tenor and um, it's piano accompaniment only, but what a great way to get your students to be working on some of this literature. Um, and right now we're, we're seeing mainly the piano accompaniment at the beginning. And if we advance to a couple of pages, we'll see where that uh, particular uh, student would start their part. And as you can see, I can click in that measure, start in that measure. You could also choose to send the assignment out starting there. But again, that's all ensemble. Great way to expose your students now to some smaller um, ensemble literature. Okay, so here we are in the small ensemble um, category. Notice I've selected small ensemble. We've got our 88 titles here. And anything you see with brass works uh, on it is Canadian brass, okay? Um, there is the adaptable quartets. We'll take a look at those in just a second. But let's take a look right now at Amazing Grace, okay? So it's a flex ensemble piece as well, which means you're going to be able to use it with your strings and brass. Choral people, it doesn't mean that you can't use this, all right? You know that you could assign um, the low part uh, to, you know, your basses. If you're dealing with a, a younger group and it's just two treble voices, you could have them just do two of the parts. Um, let's just open it up and, and show the flexibility here. So it's divided up into five parts, okay? And the trombone was limited to parts four and five. But just, just listen to the recording for a second.
maybe the, the top five kids in your school who need some enrichment or assign the piece to all of your students and then break them up into parts one, two, three, four, five, and create um, multiple quintets based upon ability level, based upon some instrumentation. It's really uh, a big resource. There's unlimited possibilities here. If you're a string teacher, um, you know, go ahead and assign the part to your violin, you know, this, and uh, now that it's violin one, we could assign them to, I believe, part one, two, three, or four. Okay. Yeah. All right. Or one, two, and three. And then you see the violas and the cellos, all right, they're getting limited to three and four. So there's a way for this small ensemble literature to be used by all. Okay. The clarity is just amazing. Let's go back for just a second. Okay. And I wanted to look real quickly at adaptable quartets. Um, and you can see they're written for all um, different instrument groups. Um, let's take a look at the violins. We'll just look at the first piece. Okay. Now here's a quartet that you could assign to your um, string ensemble um, and have your violinist work on it. Um, you could assign this to um, the top four violins if you think they need enrichment. Okay. Or if you're looking for a way to get your students to be more independent, having them work on ensemble, um, small ensemble pieces is really the way to go. Um, these are all, I believe, piano accompaniment. Two of the parts, if you wanted to, you could um, shrink the screen and get all four parts to show at the same time if you needed to. Okay, when it's performing. So those are just some things to keep in mind. All right. Trios, um, for any instrument, another great resource that's in here. Um, if you're looking for, you know, some material to um, apply to your um, ensemble, and you get three players that, you know, would love to group them together. Great um, resources here as well. Also, piano accompaniment, I believe. Okay, actually, I'm sorry. No, these are the ones that are unaccompanied. That's right. So then it is dependent upon your students. So if you're looking now to as a transition, this is why I wanted to show this book. Here's a resource now where there's no provided accompaniment and the students have to work on their parts individually. Um, that's where you teach them to you know, use record, use the tuner, use maybe the metronome, listen really carefully to their pieces. Okay, so keep that in mind, small ensemble, lots of material here um, for you to use um, that really will um, highlight and work on uh, individual development. I did want to just show real quickly. Um, I think that's it. Yes, okay. So here's the power of two duets. There's the duet, and I chose clarinet. Um, just listen to this for a second. Slow it down over here. Um, but now you're developing again that individual player. And what I love about this particular one is if you're home, you can take clarinet one um, uh, uh, and listen to just that as you play clarinet two and the opposite you'll hear only clarinet two and play clarinet one. So you're really starting to match how you sound, you know, with the other instrument in addition to the rhythm section. Okay. So that's the power of two duets, power of two duets. So small ensemble material for all. So this book is really um, an important step uh, for myself. Um, this this uh, book is written by Bob Sinecrope, and it's the book I wish I had um, as a beginning uh, jazz student and also as um, a high school band director teaching kids to improvise. Um, to me, this book meets a whole bunch of needs, and the beauty of it is it's not written just for your traditional jazz instruments. If you have an oboist, if you have a French horn player, if you've got strings, they all could be working on their jazz improvisation in this method. 
Um, Bob has done a fantastic job of um, kind of boiling it down to its lowest common denominator and then gradually seasoning your skills with the next flavor that you need to get to that next sophistication of uh, jazz improvisation. And on top of it, um, there's hyperlinks on all the pages. Um, the exercises are designed to get students to memorize, to ingrain um, tonal concepts, basically chord tones. And then, you know, he teaches them how to approach those chord tones as it gets more advanced. Um, right now, let's take a, a, a second and look at this book. And the reason I bring it up is it's, again, written for every instrument and voice. Okay, we'll start here. So this is one of his basic exercises. Okay, um, the first book that we have in Smart Music is F Blues. Um, if you click on one of Bob's links, it takes you to um, his homepage. And he's got additional uh, material to teach your students the necessary theories and things that they need. Um, but he's designed the book so that if you look at it, uh, it starts out in the very beginning with some very easy solos that are based on just a single scale to get a student interested in just performing. And then once, you know, they've got an interest there, then he's got um, more solos that are based on a minor blues scale. Then he's got more solos based on major blues scale. So it's just a, a fun beginning to get your students started. Um, there's four different backing tracks. They include all the permutations of a rhythm section. So again, this is a resource that all teachers can use with all students. Here we are internalizing chord tones. Then he's talking about internalizing the forms of two chord tones. Um, you can see his pedagogy is listen first, sing it, then start to play it. And then after you've played his exercises, he encourages everybody, don't play the exercise, just start to have some fun, just start improvising. Um, let's just listen quickly to one of his backing tracks. Oh, started in the middle of the one. Okay, um, let's just pick a different one. Just to, I'm going to go to some crazy advanced stuff here. Okay, so here's where it starts to get complicated. And now we're looking at this is the kind of material I would use with an advanced student. And I want to point out that if you're going to do this, make sure you use swing because it wasn't interpreting the my part. And I'm turning my part on so that you can hear smart music play our MIDI sound instrument along with it. Um, it's, you know, instead of me trying to play. In <laughs> And this is a more advanced concept way into the, the, the book. But again, the point is you can start at the basics. You could even do this with a general music class. Um, it's a great resource um, for introducing students to jazz, to improvisation, to getting them to have some fun, to train their ears. All right. So I, I have a concept um, and I've, I've kind of spilled the beans on it the whole presentation so far. And that's the concept of cross training your musicians. Um, what I'm suggesting here is just because we're vocalists, don't strictly use vocal materials that are in smart music, just because they're instrumentalists, don't um, limit the students to just instrumental materials. There are so many um, method books and solos and pieces um, in smart music that everybody could be using. And, you know, as a wind ensemble director, I would have my students do ear training stuff. We would, we would sing, we would hum along. Um, my jazz students, a lot of times before I asked them to hand in a performance, I'd say, I want you to sing, send it to me, you know, humming the part um, before you start to play it. Um, and in particular, this one method that just came up now, this is called listen, sing. Uh, by Dr. Cynthia Gonzalez. 
And it's an ear training method that's being used um, really all across the country now that it's in smart music, but it was her way of teaching her students at Texas State University. And um, I had the opportunity to observe her teaching, um, hear her students' abilities, and they're remarkable. Um, it's aimed at vocal singing, but if I were an instrumental teacher, I would be requiring my students to do some of these exercises because um, it's just going to make them better performers. There's a whole bunch of sight reading material that was created um, for instrumentalists in smart music. Um, it's in the uh, tab smart music uh, sight reading, but it doesn't mean that the vocalist can't go in there and use those for sight reading as well. Okay. Um, and I just want to say this, we could have our vocalists sing anything in smart music. All right. It could be um, an instrumental solo. It could be um, an instrumental ensemble piece. Um, any of the method books, again, cross train your musicians, use all the materials. Um, we've just put in a new um, set of solos here that I love. Um, they're aimed at, I would say, um, advanced beginner intermediate. Um, again, vocalists could be singing and working with these. And what I love about this particular method is it has prescriptive um, practice exercises that lead to a better performance of the solo. Really rich resource. And it's, it's very um, unique. And again, back to the Suzuki materials, all of it for all of us. Um, we definitely should be doing that. Okay, so let's go find Listen Sing for a second. So this is um, Cynthia's book, uh, Dr. Cynthia Gonzalez. And here's one of the first exercises. Um, it's just simply um, you hear it and you echo it. Notice a very slow tempo. And you're expected to sing it back in solfege. Okay. And just so you know, smart music is not evaluated. Okay. So that's echo singing. It's clearly um, several exercises in that genre. And I believe she even has an echo sing set too. She has a series of exercises learning to find the tonic and sing the tonic. Uh, Echo Sing set too. There they are. So it, it's a really rich resource, um, and you know it, you can set it for any of these voices for your instrumental students. If they're an upper register instrument, maybe you want to set it for that. You might need to know your students' uh, voice levels and tell them to just pick a voice that you feel comfortable singing in. And then you could even have them maybe um, pick up their instruments and try playing along. Do it by ear if they can't read bass clef or if they can't if they're transposing instrument that kind of thing. But uh, Listen Sing, a really great resource. Um, another one that's in here that you would find on um, uh, the method books is Building Beautiful Voices. I would actually use some of those warm-ups with my students. Um, let's go to one of the sound innovation. I think this is it. Yeah, here we go. So here, here is this solo. All right. Um, notice we've got instruction about you know, working on this. Okay, so a, a really modern sounding um, particular um, solo. And what again I loved was there are these prescriptive exercises to each one of the solos that lead your students to a better performance. Okay, so there it is, um, you know, working on that scale. So you could assign the piece to the student and then require them to do those prescriptive exercises. And again, you know, um, vocalists could be doing this, instrumentalists could be doing it, and it's written for um, each individual um, instrumental group. Okay. Flex titles. Um, during this pandemic, this has become a, an even more valuable resource because all of you are fully aware that um, your ensembles weren't always balanced full instrumentation. So the flex titles were created for those kinds of groups, but they're also a really great resource for all of us because it provides 
some interesting music that we could be doing with um, really just about any combination of, of instruments. As long as you can find an, an, enough instruments to balance and carry the parts. So it, it's a great resource. It also could be done with vocalists as well. Um, let's just take one of the flex titles and take a look at that. So here's a flex uh, ensemble title piece um, by one of my favorite composer arrangers. Um, Mike just has a great way of writing for all instrument groups and making it challenging, not too difficult, but sounding amazing. So a really nice orchestral piece, all right? And here are all the parts. And again, look how he's got them labeled. So there's four parts. So if you can just find uh, some kind of balance between the, the four parts, you could do this with as small as maybe a quartet and a little percussion, um, which uh, again brings you to, okay, this could become a small ensemble title. You could assign this to groups of students in, in your um, uh, school and then possibly take their recordings and build virtual ensembles and performances out of it. Um, we've all gotten really good at that during this uh, COVID time. And here's another great resource um, of, of that kind of material. And if you search flex titles, you'll find um, all of the flex titles that are in smart music. And we keep adding more and more um, all the time. But another great resource, take a look at flex titles. Solo titles. Here's another example of a vast resource of material in smart music for all of your students, voice and instrument. Um, some of these actually come with prescriptive instructions. I did just show you the sound innovation soloist. Um, and then the other one uh, I want to show here in a second is festival solos, where um, the student has 13 or more um, preparatory exercises that really break down the solo for the student and give him the opportunity or her the opportunity to um, build the skills necessary to do a quality performance. Um, what I find um, most of the teachers I've talked to that are using this do is they assign the solo and they instruct the students in the comments, you're required to do the preparatory work. I'm gonna be able to tell how good your performance is based upon did you do that preparatory material. Um, so instead of loading up their grade book with the solo plus 13, you know, um, lines of instruction, um, they only have the one and they can look back at the analytics and see if the student has done the prep material. And then the other thing that they can do is they can ask the student to, in the comments box when they submit, um, talk about the exercises, what, which ones did they think really improved their playing, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's a great resource. Um, and you'll see the marquees uh, that come up in smart music. If you click on them, you're going to now have a quick link to top solos for contest and competition or the newly added pop solos. And pop is a, a, a good a way to teach students other skills, um, additional skills, the same skills we're trying to teach um, with a reward. Um, it's a tune that they know or it's something they've heard and they've been asking for. So um, there's a lot of good resource there with great accompaniments. Students love doing it and they're still improving and playing on their voice and instruments. Let's take a look at festival solos. Okay, so this is a, a solo title out of festival solos, chose clarinet again. But what I wanted to show you is if I click here on the hyperlink, it takes me to another page where it's listing a series of exercises that are going to lead the student to a better performance, okay? And there's all the ones associated with lesson one, which would, um, again, uh, get them ready to perform that work. Um, I believe there's up to four lessons, yeah, for just this one. So what I would instruct the students to do again is let them see that they're going to prepare, work on these um, once they've accomplished, you know, a series. And you might want to say over a six week period or a four week period, I'm expecting you to cover all four lessons. 
um, that's up to you. You know your students best. But um, again, a great resource. You now are freed up a little bit. Um, imagine trying to teach solos, let's say to 120 students. Hard. But with something like this, smart music makes this a lot easier now. You can assign a solo. You can assign them the practice performance plan and be somewhat confident that if they're executing that, it's going to help build the skills that they need to get better at performing the work. And as you can see, these are aimed at beginning soloists. All right. And one more time, you can be using it with all the instruments um, and voice. Okay. And now to um, my final point I would like to make today. And I've been hinting at it, I know, through the whole presentation. But as a general music instructor, um, I would have smart music in my classroom. I would have it open. I would have it up on the screen every day, every class, even if I didn't use it. And the reason is there's sometimes there's teachable moments. And if you know the materials in here, you can actually create in um, Google Chrome some a folder with materials that are your favorites to get to quickly. Um, maybe, you know, for your kindergartners, you have a whole bunch of materials in smart music that you want to access quick. So you um, create a folder in Chrome and you take the URLs and you drop them in the folder and they're there and they're present for you. As a matter of fact, for today's presentation, as you noticed, I have 16 tabs open um, for this presentation. I have a folder with all of those in there. Um, and I know it took me a, a few minutes to find it, but you did notice they're labeled. So it's a quicker way to get um, material to your students. And again, if it's up, if it's running, you're not waiting for load times, the tabs are open, you just got to get to them, click on them and use them. So these are some of the reasons I think you ought to be thinking about it. Any music reading skill. Um, there's a ton of sight reading materials in here that start at a very easy basic level. There's a ton of method books that do the same thing. Um, and we have a, a built-in compose feature. So if you want to create uh, materials for your students to sight read, you can as well. And then we also have in Smart Music a sight reading builder. And those two tools are worthy of just a whole nother presentation. But take a look at them. You can make what you need, what you want for your students. Plethora of folk tunes in method books, in those Suzuki books. Um, providing really great performances of all kinds of genres and materials and groups to get your students um, comfortable with the different instrumentation of groups to understand what makes up a string ensemble, what makes up a brass quintet, what is jazz, okay? Rhythmic training, um, just uh, making a playlist and going down and having your students uh, practice, clap, tap, walk, you know, apply all of the concepts of uh, your favorite um, general music um, authors, whether it be Orth, Dalcros, Eurythmics, and use these materials. You want to teach musical style and genre? Well, you have that search engine where you can actually search by style and genre. Um, you could be teaching the instrument timbres. Um, by the way, several recorder books in here. Um, also usable for instruments, by the way. Um, there's uh, several guitar methods in here, beginning guitar methods, methods, and the ability to um, compose and start teaching students about composing. With Compose up in the room as a class, you could be building compositions, having students make choices, have fun, learn what happens when a C sharps against the C, you know, and, you know, embrace it and then, you know, build other things, uh, melodies, you know, rhythms having it up and live in the class. And if you're doing it virtually, it's the same thing. Just have it up in your Zoom screen and uh, share it with your students. So just a, a quick review. Um, we've gone through a ton of material here and it's important for us to just take a second. Just remember the whole concept of today's show um, is to take what's in smart music and utilize it. Do not be concerned with what it's labeled. You've got the world's largest digital library of music, use all of it. It does require us to get in there and kick the tires and look at the materials. Um, but I, I guarantee you, once you start to do that and you start building your favorites, use those um, folders and create folders of material for you and your students. You're gonna really be um, happy. All the method books that are in there, um, use them. Get in there, find stuff that's in there, 
um, you, you're going to find there's just a ton of stuff inside of the method books that could be used for just about anything. And Suzuki, let's use it. Let's teach a little modified Suzuki in our programs. Um, getting our students to use their ear and not focus on notation all the time is a valuable um, skill. Um, and that's one of the quickest ways I've, I've found to getting a student to sound good um, early on. Um, the small ensemble titles, it just reduces the stress of hearing um, 25 different instruments. You've only got the four. Um, and the fact that a lot of them are, especially since Canadian brass, are like timbre, it allows us to focus. If it's the um, quartets or trios, the fact that it's piano accompaniment, again, less material for me to listen to. I can focus on my part. I can actually look at the other parts and start to see how is this built? How is it put together? Um, introduce your students to jazz. Um, I introduced Bob's book. Um, I strongly believe in it. Um, it's something I would like us all to take a look at. There's even more material in there. Um, there's all kinds of uh, improv uh, accompaniments to work on. There are method books that focus on teaching students the style of jazz. Um, and all instruments and voice can be using those tools, those skills. Um, and don't be afraid to cross train. Um, vocalists need to um, be exposed to the instrumental materials and definitely all of our instrumental students need to be exposed to the vocal materials that are in there as well. Flex titles, um, again, a, a, it's, it's like the small ensemble piece where you can reduce the amount of material that your students have um, to listen to and have them practice. Um, and if you're in that situation where you don't have full uh, ensemble um, instrumentation, you can um, balance it out just by knowing those, you know, basic, you know, four or five parts and maybe a little percussion. So flex titles are a great way for you to um, also build those individual skills. And for all my general music teachers um, out there, use this. It's, it's a great tool. Um, you know, get a teacher subscription, have it in your class, project it up on the board. Um, and again, if you don't use it that day in class, fine. But it's there as a resource whenever you want to um, grab your materials. Okay. Well, I hope um, this has been a valuable um, session for all of you. I um, applaud you for being here and checking it out. I want to thank you personally. Uh, again, my name is Ted Scalzo. And there's my email address uh, if you have any questions regarding anything I've presented in today's uh, presentation. Feel free to reach out to me. And um, I look forward to hearing from all of you. Um, maybe you've got some uh, further suggestions on how we can um, tie into all the resources in smart music. I love hearing from uh, other teachers how you're using smart music in your classroom. Thank you once again, and everybody have a great day.